a variant of this paradox is the idea that if I even want to move at all, if my atoms want to pass in space, first they have to go halfway. But before it can go halfway, it's got to go halfway of that half, and halfway of that half, and that half of that half. So Zeno, back in Greece, actually used this to prove that motion was impossible, and that any motion we saw in the universe was an illusion. So it's weird. Why? Um, and nobody really could answer Zeno for the longest time. But then it took, essentially, the development of the understanding of, of limits and calculus to really get an idea of why this wasn't paradoxical. What rigorously did we mean by an infinite number of steps? What, how could we actually get to the cross, across the room? It seemed paradoxical, but we knew it had to be true. We knew motion had to be possible. Um, I'm sure when you were all younger, or even now, you've seen all sorts of kind of falsitical paradoxes where somebody will write out a string of, uh, if you take one plus, if you take one minus one plus one minus one, dot, 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 and the person convinces you, well, look, if you look in groups of this, um, these are all zeros. So if you just add a bunch of zeros together, this is necessarily zero. But I mean, this is an infinite string, right? And we can repeat the pattern. Um, what happens if we add a 1, right? So suddenly we get these weird conclusions where 0 equals 1, and they're usually built on kind of doing something illegal involving infinities. And infinity is going to be a very important concept that we'll encounter again and again. Finally, the antinomy. These, these are the important paradoxes to think about. I once went out to dinner with a bunch of mathematicians. I don't know how I ended up in that, but let me tell you, it was kind of frightening. Um, and there was this Korean mathematician who said, well, you know what? Like, most of these questions don't even matter. We don't, we don't understand some of the most fundamental things. And the thing he was most interested in, and I think which bothers mathematicians the most, is the uh, antinomy of the, of the liar and Russell's paradox. Um, so the liar's paradox, you probably have heard before. And it starts, it's based on actually a, a biblical reference, but it essentially says this sentence is not true. So is it true or is it not true? Well, if it's true, then it says of itself that it's not true. So true implies not true. Contradiction. So if it's not true, then we know that if we believe in the law of the excluded middle, which means that things have to either be true or not true, that its negation is true. So if it's not true, then the sentence is true. So not true implies true. So we're stuck. The liar paradox still hounds us today. Unlike Zeno's paradox, it hasn't been solved. We still don't know how to deal with it. And when we talk about Gödel's theorem, the way he proves his result is actually going to be intimately linked with a variant on this. So instead of saying, I'm not true, it's going to say, I'm not provable. And that's going to be a very interesting idea. And we'll explore that a little bit later. The other antinomy I want to look at is Russell's paradox, also known as the Barber's paradox. And that's how I'm going to tell it. It's the Barber's paradox. I think it's a little more friendly. So you have a town, and there's this male barber. And he abides by the rule that he shaves all people and only people who don't shave themselves. So what does the barber do when his beard is getting as thick as mine? Does he shave himself or does he not? Well, let's see. So by definition, the barber only shaves those people who don't shave themselves. So if he shaves himself, then he doesn't. And if he doesn't shave himself, then by definition, he must shave himself. A variant of this, is, which, which was coined by both Bertrand Russell, Cambridge mathematician and philosopher, and Zermelo, 
great German logician, um, is the idea that you can consider the set, let's call it omega, which contains all sets that aren't members of themselves. So remember, a set is just a collection of objects. And the mathematicians really believed that set theory was going to be what gave mathematics its ultimate sure and fo logical foundation. So let's give an example of a set which contains itself. So let's think of the set of all things which aren't Joan of Arc. Well, sets aren't people. I mean, they're people, not sets. Um, so that set of all things which aren't Joan of Arc includes itself because a set can never be a person. So that set is contained in itself. Um, so we have a bunch of things in here which are sets which aren't members of themselves. And then we ask the question, is omega an element of itself? And this means is in. Um, well, if omega contains itself, but omega, by definition, only contains things which don't contain themselves, so it can't contain itself. Well, if it can't contain itself, it doesn't contain itself, and that means it should contain itself. Contradiction. Um, this really, really bothered a lot of mathematicians for a long time. Um, and it's, it's an exact variant on the Barber's Paradox. So. This is a, kind of an interesting thing to play around with. Finally, is the concept of infinity. I can't really talk too much about it. We're going to look at it more. But I want to introduce you guys to the idea that there are multiple types of infinity. So you have the integers, and you also have the real numbers. And it is true that you cannot create a, a direct link. You can't match every real number, like 0.333333. Well, 0.35 something random pi. Let's pick pi. You can't put pi directly in connection with a natural number, an integer. Um, and this is kind of famous Cantor's diagonalization argument. So somehow there are different degrees of infinity, and the real numbers is a higher degree of infinity. So that's, that's an important thing to think about. Now we're going to jump ahead to our last tool for thinking, and this is going to be the reason why we ignore the first three chapters of Gödel Escher Bach. And it's the idea of a formal system. The problem is, is formal systems are boring. Um, and Douglas Hofstadter takes his sweet, sweet time in introducing you to the concept of a, of a formal system. Um, so I'm going to try to speed things up, because I know you all are smarter than that. And you can get through these concepts very quickly. Um, we're going to play a game. It's called the Moo Puzzle, or MU. Um, and the way you play it is you start with you have a bag of three letters. And you're going to have a rule. You're going to start with. You pull two letters out and you get 